And welcome to The Motivational Midwife. I'm Lynn Jones, and today we're going to be looking at one of my favourite topics to teach, and that's newborn life support. newborn life support what is it is it resuscitation well it's not resuscitation as we often think of resuscitation as uh, as we would in an adult situation it's really just a baby that's failed to make that transition from in utero to extra uterine life and needs a, f- a little bit of support Now, you can be fairly reassured that the vast majority of babies are not going to require anything more than what we would call primary resuscitation. So that's a swift dry with a brush, with a brush, with a towel and um, airway opened and a hat on. Most babies will cry within uh, a minute and a half of birth. Um, But it is important that you have got an individualized assessment really considered for the babies that uh, or the woman you're looking after so that if there are any risk factors that you have the appropriate things in place um, to support you supporting that baby making the transition and we'll go into some of those risk factors as we go through this. So why are babies at risk in the first place? Well their relative um, Their surface area is really relatively large compared to their size. They're quite small. And the baby's um, head is a third the surface area um, of the baby. So actually this head loses a phenomenal amount of heat. So it's important that we dry the baby. Babies are born wet and this predisposes them to losing heat very rapidly. And babies lose heat by convection, conduction, radiation and evaporation. And if we left this baby naked and wet, its temperature is going to drop very rapidly, as you can see, down to 33 degrees in just five minutes. And for every degree below 36.5, which is kind of your baseline normal, um, it increases the risk of mortality for that baby quite significantly. We can keep the baby uh, warm most effectively by skin to skin with mother. So if you put the baby skin to skin with mum, there's some fantastic infrared um, footage out there, although I couldn't find the link for it to to be able to to show you that, is um, showing you the mother's body temperature increasing to hurt her, uh, to hurt her baby, to warm her baby. Um, So it can go up a couple of degrees to actually warm the baby up. So skin to skin is by far the most effective way of bringing that baby's temperature up. And why do we need to even consider that apart from the increasing the risk of mortality is if you take a step back and think of your neonatal energy triangle, we've got oxygen, glucose and temperature. And if we affect any one of those, then the other two will also be affected. So a cold baby is actually harder to resuscitate because if the baby is cold, it's going to need increased oxygen and glucose supplies to to just form normal metabolism. And the other issue that babies have is they have lungs that are filled with fluid. When they're in utero, the lungs do not need to perform gaseous exchange because this is all done at the placenta. So Fetal lung fluid actually really is there to help the development and growth of the lungs. And babies in utero often uh, develop um, fetal breathing movements, which also help get the the lungs ready for when they have to actually perform as lungs and do gaseous exchange. And this fetal lung fluid is is essentially um, made by the, the lung epithelium. So at point of birth, the the baby has sort of 10 to 25 mils per kilo that will either need to be reabsorbed or expelled in order for the lungs to function properly. And this happens in a couple of ways. Uh, Partly when labour occurs, there is a shift of hormones from 
those that encourage production of fetal lung fluid to those that will encourage reabsorption of fetal lung fluid. So if you think about women who have a elective cesarean section, they've not gone into labor, so they haven't had this shift of hormones. Um, so these babies are more likely to have something called transit ta transient tachypnea of the newborn. So they, they're more likely to have be these babies that grunt a little bit at delivery. They do this sort of uh, uh, noise. So they've still got a little bit of fluid in there. And they also haven't been squeezed through um, the vagina. So they haven't had that mechanical squeezing to help um, get rid of some of that fluid as well. So some of those risk factors as well that we're talking about, I've, I've just mentioned cesarean section, which isn't on this list, but I say there are many, many more. Uh, these are just some of the risk factors. And the most obvious one would be a preterm baby. A preterm baby, its lungs are not going to be as well developed as a term baby. But the other key thing for a preterm baby is its lack of surfactant in the lungs. And surfactant, as you might remember, is, is a bit like a soapy substance that helps keep the alveoli um, partly open. So when the baby takes a breath for the first time, uh, the alveoli open up and they never really collapse completely back down on themselves because of surfactant. It keeps that tension in the alveoli there. It's a little bit like blowing up a balloon. If you blow up a balloon for the first time, it's really hard work the first time. Well, it is for me. And then if you let that balloon down and you blow it up again, it's much easier to blow it up the second time. And that is very similar to the lung alveoli. Um, the surfactant helps that. So your preterm baby, surfactant doesn't really start being produced till about 26 weeks. And it really surges from about 30 weeks onwards. So the more preterm the baby is, the less surfactant those babies have. Um, which is why we give um, steroids such as dexamethasone because it stimulates that surfactant production. Hypoxic events uh, such as your antepartum hemorrhage, your cord prolapse, um, shoulder dystocia, um, labor itself to some extent is a hypoxic event, but your well-grown term baby is, is really well designed to cope with um, those short periods of hypoxia that, that contractions uh, bring. Um, but babies who are compromised in any way are not going to cope as well with, uh, with labour. Drugs, particularly opioids, as opioids are respiratory depressants. So drugs such as pethidine, um, dimorphine, uh, they are going to cross placenta and they will um, have an effect on that respiratory respiratory centers in the baby. Maternal infection, uh, any sort of maternal infection, but particularly things like gruby strep, um, uh, potentially they're going to put the babies at risk as well. And therefore, you know, if you've already got a baby that's infected, that is going to uh, potentially require some assistance to make that transition. Maternal diabetes, uh, babies of diabetic mothers, um, diabetes interferes with surfactant production for diabetic Mothers, often you also have a, a macrosomic baby um, that may be sort of large in size, but in terms of gestation, not quite so far along the road as you as you think. Obviously, any pathological or suspicious CTG uh, concerns, because that is telling you that this baby is already um, beginning to become compromised. So if you've got a compromised baby in labour, then there is a good chance it's going to need some assistance to make that transition. Prolonged or precipitate labour. So the prolonged labour, obviously, the baby is going to use its stores up and may become um, compromised. Precipitate labour, um, if you have a very quick labour, then obviously you have less chance for that fetal lung fluid to be reabsorbed and it all happens very quickly. So you might have a little bit of fluid still left in, in the lungs there. It's a little bit of a shock for the baby, so it just may need a little bit of help getting going. Any sort of birth trauma, instrumental deliveries, operative birth. So you have to think to yourself, why has this baby required um, in intervention? Was it because it was already um, becoming compromised. Breach, you've got cord um, compression within breach. Um, meconium stained lycra, so if you're particularly fresh meconium, uh, is should always alert you to the fact that this baby is um, potentially becoming compromised and may need some assistance at birth. 
Prolonged rupture of membranes increases the infection risks for these babies. Uh, fetal abnormalities, particularly with cardiovascular system. Um, don't lull yourself into a false sense of security that she had a scan at 20 weeks and, and there was nothing picked up because actually scans miss about 50% of cardiac abnormalities. So, you know, if you'll go on to do your newborn infant physical examination training, your NIPE training, um, it, that was certainly something that was a bit of an eye opener to me because I just assumed that if there was a problem, the scan would pick it up. Uh, but that is not the case. Only about 50 percent of cardiac abnormalities are, in fact, highlighted on scans. And if you've got a growth restricted baby, well, this baby's already got a lower threshold um, for coping. It's got very um, lower reserves to actually get through labour. So is it a big problem? Um, thankfully not really. Most babies will require no more than primary resuscitation. We've said drying them, um, putting them skin to skin. And if they're skin to skin, just be mindful that you, you, you haven't got a head that is um, flexed, hyperflexed or hyperextended. You want the baby just to bring the baby's head up so it's, it's in a neutral position and put a hat on. OK, so there's a, a sweet, very large Swedish study that highlighted that um, only one percent of, of well-grown term babies actually needed more than that primary resuscitation that actually needed um, inflation breaths or ventilation breaths plus or minus intubation. So intubation is where they put the endotracheal tube in um, to the baby and then commence breathing for the baby mechanically. Um, an American study found that only 0.12% required chest compressions and of those, all those babies, only one in 2000 required drugs. So you can see that it's a very, very tiny, tiny proportion of babies will require um, more than just uh, inflation and ventilation breaths on top of primary resuscitation. Very few will require chest compressions and or drugs. And most of the babies that do require those, you are expecting. You, you've already got the personnel in place because it's maybe a very preterm baby or it's a baby that you've got, has got a known um, abnormality and you're, so you're ready for it. And how are you going to recognise that this baby requires some help? Well, quite obviously, it won't be breathing. Um, it may well be pale um, and it may well be floppy. Heart rate might be low, but often its uh, heart rate is normal. So what are we going to do? Well, as an accountable and autonomous practitioner, remember under your um, NMC um, code of conduct and midwife proficiencies, you know, you are in terms of maintaining safety, it's important that you check your emergency equipment. OK, you're a accountable practitioner. You need to check, to ensure that your equipment is working. So when you take over the care um, of someone you in a hospital setting, if you have a resuscitator that is um, within the room or wherever it is that you would go to for that resuscitator in the event of an emergency, you need to make sure that it is checked. And it's not good enough to say, oh, well, so-and-so checked it earlier. You are accountable. Um, to ensure that your equipment is checked and ready. And if you're a home uh, community midwife and you're going out to home birth, it's your job to ensure that your emergency equipment you're taking with you is in fact working, checked and working. So you're going to pull the emergency bell and help will come into the room. In a, in a hospital situation, they come quite quickly. Um, in a home birth situation, um, hopefully you've got your second midwife there already with you, but you'd need to, to get your 999 blue light paramedic ambulance en route to help you um, either resuscitate the baby or certainly transport, transport the baby in um, following resuscitation. Because if a baby has needed resuscitation at a home birth, I would suggest that it would be prudent for it to come into hospital for some observation, even if it's just a few hours. Um, you commence your resuscitation. If it's obvious that this baby is going to need more um, than just you and the help you've got in the room, then you need to delegate someone to put out your double two double two and ask for your neonatal team to come so you have a bit more expertise heading to the room. 
talk to the mother, tell her the baby is not breathing effectively. So you need to um, have some help in the room and that you're going to help your the baby and make that transition from into uterine to extra uterine life and don't forget she's probably still got a placenta in situ so if you're resuscitating the baby when someone else comes into the room you need to delegate them really to be managing that third stage however the mother has chosen to have her third stage managed so note the time that you've the baby's been born it's not made that uh, transition clamp and cut the cord um, the Resus Council do suggest, uh, whilst they um, support delayed cord clamping, they say that you shouldn't delay resuscitation in order to facilitate delayed cord clamping. Now, there are some units that have these really great resuscitation tables that you can bring next to the bed so you can resuscitate with the cord still intact. Um, but um, I've not seen any of those actually in use. Uh, certainly where I've worked over the years um, and also clamping and cutting the cord is one of the potential stimuluses for um, encouraging the baby to start breathing anyway. Start the clock on your resuscitator, put the baby on um, and give that baby a nice vigorous dry remember and um, that towel will then be wet so change that towel so we don't impact on the baby's heat loss put the baby's head into a neutral position, apply a hat. And then when the baby is in a neutral position, so neutral position, as we've said, is in line with the shoulders, um, face parallel to the surface that you're working on. Um, and so not hyperextended, not hyperflexed. And the babies have large occiput. So if there's a lot of molding there um, and this baby's got a large occiput, it may well be pushing the head forward. So you're um, flexing the baby's head. So you might need to roll up a towel under the shoulders just to help you maintain that neutral position. So when you've got neutral position, um, then assess the baby. So what's the baby's heart rate? You need to look um, or listen to the baby's heart rate with a paediatric stethoscope. And you're listening about a centimetre under the left nipple. OK, and you're not, it's, you know, time is off the essence here when we're looking at resuscitation um, or making that baby, help that baby uh, make that transition. So you're not listening for 30 seconds or a minute. You really are making a snap decision on what you hear. And if I um, might be able to do it on this box. So I would tend to tap out uh, what I can hear. So if you were listening in and you could hear you'd think actually that heart rate sounds fine. I've only listened for a few seconds, but that sounds fine. If I'm listening and I hear, I can tell it's a little bit slower, but it still sounds reasonably acceptable. If I hear this, I can tell that baby's heart rate is slow. At this point in time, um, the heart rate is irrelevant because we have no chest movement. OK, so if your baby is not breathing and we haven't got chest movement, we are not going to be able to get oxygen to the myocardium. So we need our key priority is on really inflating those lungs and making sure that we can get oxygen to the myocardium. So how are we going to do that? So we resuscitate in air. Many years ago, we used to use um, oxygen, but now we resuscitate in air because there's 21% oxygen in air. And in a hospital setting on your resuscitators, they've often got um, some tubing with the mask attached with a little T piece on the top that you put your thumb on and off to, in order to create the seal to get um, the chest to rise. Um, I'm gonna talk about using a bag valve mask. OK, so the bag usually has a 500 mil reservoir. It has a pop off valve um, which stops um, excessive pressure um, being used to open those um, alveoli up and push the, the lung fluid out. These are set at for generally 30 to 40 centimetres water pressure and 30 centimetres of water pressure is the amount of pressure you need to push that fluid out of the lungs into the interstitial spaces. So if I was to just press, if I occlude that and press, I don't know if you can hear that particularly well. You get a pop off sound um, and that's the extra pressure being um, 
popped off being blown out elsewhere so it's not going to the baby's lungs because if you put excessive pressure down the baby's lungs what you will do is cause a pneumothorax um, and in order to deliver that you need to have a mask and the mask size is important if you have a mask that is too small um, you're not going to to get a good seal and if you have a mask that's too large then you are going to cause pressure on the eyes which will cause a vagal response um, which will cause a bradycardia in a baby that is already compromised so you measure the mask from the cleft of the chin to the bridge of the nose and when you've got that mask on then you are going to roll the mask on from the cleft of the chin to the bridge of the nose when it's attached to the bag. And then you are going to use a C and E grip. So the C grip is um, on the stem um, so that you're, it's a bit like holding a, a wine glass. And then the E grip, because your fingers are a bit like an E, essentially are on the bony jaw here. And then you will deliver five slow inflation breaths. And what inflation breaths do is they inflate the lungs, they push the lung fluid out. So they need to be slow inflation breaths. So I tend to, to do one inflation breath release, two inflation breath release. And that, um, they're two to three seconds long. You do five of those and then you reassess the baby. And it's quite likely that you won't get chest movement on the first two or three as it's pushing that fluid out of the lungs. It may be the third or the fourth or even the fifth one that you get chest rise on. So then reassess the baby. What's the heart rate, colour, tone? Is the baby breathing? Have you seen the chest rise? If you haven't seen the chest rise, then you move on to the next strategy to aerate the lungs. So rechecking your neutral position. OK, this is an adrenaline filled situation and we are it's very likely that we we are quite um, fired up when we're trying to do this. And it may well be that we have inadvertently either hyperflexed or hyperextended the baby's head so we've occluded the airway so recheck that neutral position and just make sure that um, we are in neutral and then we have something called the three p's so we're checking the position of the baby am i in neutral position the position of the mask is it where it's meant to be cleft of the uh, chin to the bridge of the nose have i got a good seal have i got enough pressure on the mask in order to be able to have a good seal and then um, I'm pulling the baby's jaw into the mask. Uh, sometimes this was referred to as a single person jaw thrust or a single handed jaw thrust. And you can see on this, this picture um, that the um, C grip on the stem of the bag and valve and then ring and middle finger or ring min min finger or middle finger is pulling the angle of the jaw. So that's this bit here up into the mask. Repeat your five inflation breaths and then reassess the baby. Heart rate, color, tone, is the baby breathing? And most importantly, have I got chest movement? If I've got no chest movement, I need to go on to my next strategy. So this would be a two person jaw thrust. So one person is doing the jaw thrust and the other person will be doing the five inflation breaths. OK, so this is not something you can do on your own. You cannot do a two person jaw thrust on your own. And what a jaw thrust does is you are aiming to lift. The angle of the jaw towards the ceiling, towards the um, in order to lift the tongue off the airway. So you'd place your fingers on the cheekbones and your ring or middle finger on the angle of the jaw and you will lift. 
So reassess the baby. If I've still seen no chest movement, what's my next strategy? So my next strategy would be, is there an obstruction? Um, now, we used to suction everything many, many years ago, but this has uh, really been proven to be ineffective. Um, and we should only be really um, suctioning large particulate which we'll go into in a second. So I'm checking for an obstruction. Do I need to put an oropharyngeal airway in? And if I do, it needs to be measured for the correct size. So in order to do that, I need some equipment. I need a laryngoscope, which is a left-handed instrument, which is a light source. Um, and you hold it in your left hand and we use it uh, as a midwife, as a tongue depressor and a light source. That's all we use it for. And then obviously I need my oropharyngeal airway and we need to measure that from the middle of the lip to the angle of the jaw. In order to insert the laryngoscope you need to protect the upper lip and gums and I tend to do that by my, putting my little finger just in the corner of the mouth and then I will use that as the angle I'm going to go in at so I've got my laryngoscope facing away from me um, and then I'm going to have my little finger there and I'm going to follow that so I'll go in at that sort of angle over the top of the tongue um, and keep the tongue out of the way because what I'm really doing if I'm using my laryngoscope I want to see the back of the baby's mouth I want to see the back of the throat is there an obstruction there is there a a, a blood clot a lump of uh, meconium um, with meconium uh, as many years ago we used to um, suction meconium before we started uh, doing any resuscitation however the resuscitation council say it's appropriate if you've been trained to have a quick look with your laryngoscope and suction any obvious um, obstruction out but do not delay inflating those lungs to be having a look with the laryngoscope so the the, the key is on aerating the lungs very often if they've aspirated they've aspirated in utero it's already happened before the baby is born so once you've got your laryngoscope in and you've had a look and you've seen um, that there is no obstruction or there is an obstruction, then you're going to insert your oral pharyngeal airway. Now with an adult, um, your OPA goes in that way and then you turn it round. With a baby, you put it in following the line of the anatomy. So it will go in like that over the top of the tongue. It's important that it's measured because if you have... Um, too small, it will um, bunch up the tongue and obstruct, you won't have a patent airway. And if it's too large, it will occlude the airway at the back. So it is important that you actually have um, the correctly sized OPA and that you insert it properly. Because if you insert it properly, you then will have a patent airway unless there is something congenitally wrong with the baby. If you do see an obstruction, you do need to uh, suction, then obviously it needs to be done under um, direct visualisation. So your laryngoscope or your light source needs to be in situ and you use a wide bore paediatric Yanka sucker. So an, a nice wide bore suction so that it picks up that large particulate. We shouldn't be suctioning fluid per se because fluid per se is not going to cause an obstruction. You only suction what you can see. You don't go poking the, the suction catheter right down the back of the throat. Again, you will cause a vagal response, which will cause a, a bradycardia in this already very compromised baby. Um, and suction only on the way out. So occlude your suction while it's going in and then suction as you're coming back out with your suction catheter. So as I say, we've inserted the um, airway in, in with the line of the anatomy. Repeat our five inflation breaths and you should see chest rise uh, once you've got an OPA in. And certainly many trusts, certainly for their community midwives, will often say go straight to uh, inserting an airway if they're having to resuscitate at home, particularly if you're on your own, because this is going to, to fairly well in, ensure that you have got a patent airway. So your resuscitation will be, um, your inflation breaths should then be effective. 
So do your five inflation breaths and then reassess the baby. Uh, what's the baby's heart rate, colour, tone? Is the baby breathing? And you should have chest rise by this point. So we've now got chest rise, but the baby is still not breathing effectively. So what can we do? We need to do ventilation breaths. And ventilation breaths aim to mimic normal neonatal breathing. So you're looking at 30 to 40 per minute. And they're given, um, they're much quicker breaths, so they're shorter. So it's um, one in, one out, one in, one out. So they're given one breath over one to two seconds. So you're really getting about 15 breaths in a 30 second period and you would reassess the baby after 30 seconds. So you do ventilation breaths once you have chest movement. So you know you've aerated those lungs, the baby is not breathing effectively. And then the other reason we would do um, ventilation breaths is before cardiac compression. So we've got chest movement, baby's not breathing. Um, we do 30 seconds of ventilation breaths and then reassess. If the baby's heart rate is low at this point, then we commence cardiac compressions. So cardiac compressions we do when the heart rate is slow or absent, but you have to have seen chest movement. If you have not got chest rise, um, you will not aerate the, myo the, the lungs and you will not send oxygen to the myocardium. So it's not going to, to be effective if you haven't got chest movement. So you need chest movement and you've done 30 seconds of ventilation breaths in an aim to actually, an aim to, um, oxygenate that myocardium. Reassess the baby. If the heart rate remains slow, then you carry on with cardiac compressions. And so what you're aiming to do, gold standard would be to use the encircling technique, uh, which is the picture on the left here. Um, so you're uh, a centimetre below the nipple line, you're on the sternum and you are really um, compressing the that AP diameter about a third and the ratio is three compressions to one breath so it's a two-person job. If um, your hands are small they don't go around the baby or um, the neonatal team is trying to insert an umbilical venous catheter then you may need to use the two finger method which uh, you need to just make sure that your fingers are um, even here, so you might need to bend your middle finger, but the landmark is the same and your compression depth is the same. So you would do that for 30 seconds and then reassess the baby. If there's been no um, improvement in the baby, the neonatal team may decide to administer drugs. And drugs are administered through an umbilical venous catheter. And each drug is followed by a five mil saline flush. This is in order to, these, the amount of drug you're using in terms of volume is quite small. So it will sit in that umbilical venous catheter unless you flush it through to where it needs to go and also do a round of chest compressions um, between each drug to actually get it to where it needs to go. So the first drug they might use is adrenaline and the strength is one in 10,000. In adults, we use one in 1,000. And the first um, dose they would use would be 1.0 mil per kilo. So if you had a three kilo baby and you're guesstimating that weight or the neonatal team is guesstimating the weight, they would use 0.3 of a mil as the first dose. A subsequent dose is it'll be 0.3 mils per kilo. And what adrenaline does is it makes the heart muscle contract better. So it increases that contractility of the cardiac muscle. However, if you've got to this point, this baby is likely to be very acidotic um, because it will have been anaerobically metabolizing and therefore it will have built up lactic acid. It's going to have become um, acidotic. So sodium bicarbonate might be the next drug they use. The order in which these are given in um, is entirely down to the neonatal team administering it. Um, some teams will give the bicarbonate first and then the adrenaline. Others will do the adrenaline and then the bicarbonate. Um, it's 4.2% strength and 2 to 4 mils per kilo. And as I say, it will neutralize acidosis, therefore making the adrenaline more effective. At the time they insert the uh, UVC, the umbilical venous catheter, they're likely to have taken blood to see the extent of the acidosis and also uh, blood glucose. So if it's be because babies will use up their um, glucose stores uh, in order to um, for the cells to be functioning. So they use it up in resusc resuscitation very quickly. So if the um, 
blood glucose is less than 2.5, then dextrose 10% might be considered 2.5 to 5 mils per kilo. Um, again, that is entirely down to the neonatal team. So again, between each drug, 5 mil saline flush in a round of compressions, then reassess the baby. Very occasionally, um, it's considered maybe a volume issue, and these would be for babies of maybe antepartum hemorrhage uh, scenarios. And uh, in that instance, they may consider using pediatric O negative blood, saline or Hartman's, and that would be at 10 mils per kilo. And there we have it, newborn life support. I hope you found that useful. Please do go on the Resuscitation Council's website. There'll be a link in the comments section below. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do and look out for our Facebook page. I look forward to seeing you next time.